How do you, oh wait, is anyone here yet? All right, it is recording. Howdy everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this week's Seaside Chat. I am so excited for this week's speaker. Um, this is Julie Massey and she is our Coastal Marine Resources Agent. Thank you so much for being here, Julie. How are you? I'm great. I'm great. I'm really happy to be here with y'all this afternoon and I'm looking forward to talking to you a little bit about one of my favorite places on the planet, Galveston Bay. So um, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. I'll share my screen and we'll... While you do that, I'm going to release our first set of polls. So if our viewers wouldn't mind filling that out, that would be really great for us. Here we go. I'll give you all time to do the, the poll real quick. So should we go ahead and start or do we still have people filling out our uh, survey? We have a lot of people coming in, so we're gonna give them a few more minutes to fill it out. Um, do you wanna tell us a little bit more of what you do for Texas Sea Grant while they fill it out? Yes, well, um, I'm the Coastal Marine Resource Agent for Galveston uh, County. So I get to work with all of the resources that we have here and all the amazing people that live in the Galveston Bay area. Um, I've been in this position for a long time and have really enjoyed it. I get to work with the amazing volunteers who I'll talk about a little bit in my presentation, the Texas Master Naturalist. And um, with a Texas Sea Grant, one of the great things about working for Texas Sea Grant is that we get involved in a lot, of, a big variety of projects, and which really uh, is exciting because all of a sudden you uh, see a problem and then you work with specialists and uh, other agencies within Sea Grant uh, or within A&M and uh, other uh, resource agencies to find solutions for, the, for those problems. So we're, um, we, we're known for problem solving and uh, educating people on how they can help us uh, solve problems. So it's a great, um, great job. So are we ready? Yes, ma'am, take it away. Okay, okay. Well, I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about Galveston Bay. As I said earlier, it's one of my favorite places on the planet and I hope it will be uh, yours after you learn a little bit more about it today. Okay, whoops. All right, now getting my, my okay, well, this is, just getting it to, oh, there we go. Okay, so the Galveston Bay is part of the, the Galveston Bay watershed includes the Trinity River watershed. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Trinity River watershed because that's what we consider the upper Galveston Bay watershed. It goes all the way past the Dallas-Fort Worth area. It includes 38 Texas counties, about 8 million people, 22 reservoirs, and 80% of the water in the Trinity River is used to meet municipal demands. That means that we pull the water out of the river and use it for uh, watering our yards, flushing our toilets, all those things that, uh, that we do um, in our homes and stuff um, to, uh, for water use. So by the time the water reaches the Galveston Bay area, that water has been used Actually, they figure about seven times. So it's a very, I mean, it's well used water. And so, you know, and, and it can be impacted by the time it reaches us. Also, there's issues with um, a water availability for Galveston Bay. Our water rights uh, laws in Texas uh, uh, allow water rights owners to demand their rights, to declare their rights for water uh, when they need it. And uh, if all uh, so all the water on the Trinity River is uh, tied up in those water rights. So if all of the water right owners decided on one day that they wanted their water that day, well, we wouldn't be receiving but a few drops of water. So uh, we have to manage those water rights to maintain that flow into Galveston Bay. And I'll talk more about why that's important. Within the Galveston Bay system, we, uh, have about 50% of the population of Texas lives within our Galveston Bay watershed. And we have about 9% uh, 
of uh, the Texas uh, sur uh, surface area in our watershed. So we have big impacts on our Galveston Bay. Now this is an aerial photograph of Galveston Bay. We are the seventh largest estuary in the US. We have 50% of the petroleum industry sits on our shores, 40% of the chemical industry. We have two of the largest uh, ports and the second largest boating population in the US. So in addition to having a lot of people, our bay system has a lot of uh, heavy use. And I wanna just uh, talk to you a little bit about parts of the bay in case you're not so familiar. Um, so this is the Galveston Bay area. This is East Bay here, and this is West Bay. This is the Trinity uh, Bay. The Trinity River comes in here, and the San Jacinto River comes in here. And those are the major water sources, freshwater sources for Galveston Bay. This is Bolivar Roads, or Bolivar, I'm sorry, Bolivar Peninsula. This is Galveston Island, and this out here is the Gulf of Mexico. And uh, this is what we call Bolivar Roads. Now an estuary, I use that word estuary and I just wanted to define it really quick for those who may not be so familiar with uh, the word estuary. But an estuary is a place where fresh water from our rivers and runoff from our land mixes with salt water like that uh, water from the Gulf of Mexico. And this mixing, it's a, these are some of the most valuable habitats that we have on the planet because that mixing allows a a great diversity of animals and habitats. So, um, so estuaries are really, really important to us um, environmentally and uh, commercially or uh, uh, economically. I wanna point out here the Texas City uh, Dyke, which is a five mile long structure. And um, the dyke has, it was built to prevent shoaling or filling in of the Texas City Ship Channel. And there is major uh, chemical and um, petroleum production in this area. So being able to ship uh, those products out is important. But uh, when you have fresh water coming in from the Trinity and the San Jacinto, and this mixing, like I mentioned, with the salt water from uh, the Gulf of Mexico is really important. So what used to happen is fresh water would come in and it would mix and it would flow into uh, West Bay and East Bay. But now because of the Texas City dike, a lot of this fresh water as it comes in, it hits the dike and it goes straight out into the Gulf of Mexico. So we don't have as much fresh water um, mixing in here uh, in this part of West Bay. If I stand on the dike, and I take the salinity on this side and I walk across the dike and take the salinity on this side, there's usually a, a fairly large difference, especially in the summertime. So this has impacted some of our um, production of, um, of oysters and other uh, species because of this higher salinity. Estuaries like Galveston Bay are really important for, and they serve as nursery areas for ba baby fish crabs and shrimp that may be born in the Gulf of Mexico and float with the tides and currents into the marshes of Galveston Bay. And I'll talk more about that uh, later. But I just wanted to get, and I wanted to, so y'all can be um, uh, uh, Galveston Bay warriors after today's event. I want you to point, I want to point out to you, we show this to kids. I do, get to do a lot of work with kids, but this is the Galveston Bay warrior. You can see his head here, his shoulder here. This is one leg. He's kind of doing the splits and this is the other leg and this is his shield and of course this is the plume on his helmet. So I hope that by the end of today y'all will all be Galveston Bay warriors too. So I'm going to continue on. If y'all have questions along the way please uh, put them in the question and answer session or if you want to uh, chat. So Galveston Bay is a valuable resource. It's the second most uh, productive bay in the U.S and the most productive bay in Texas, supporting fisheries for oysters, shrimp, blue crab, and fin fish. And as I mentioned, it is one of nature's nursery areas because those baby fish, crabs, and shrimp that are born in the Gulf of Mexico float with the tides and currents into our marshes. They hang out in the marshes until they get big enough to fin for themselves and they move back into the bay and into the Gulf to continue their life cycle. So that, you know, um, here in Texas, we always kind of, um, question uh, that we might be the second to something, but the, uh, there is the idea that we are second to the Chesapeake Bay on production. Although we uh, ship many of our uh, blue crabs to the Chesapeake Bay area 
for uh, serving as um, Chesapeake Bay crabs. So uh, if you get a chance, enjoy our blue crabs here. Uh, more of our economic value, we have the most oyster production in the US, which is about $20 million a year. The largest blue crab harvest in Texas, which is $10 million a year and a commercial shrimp harvest of $35 million a year. So I hope those of you who enjoy seafood, I hope you enjoy seafood from Galveston Bay because it doesn't get any fresher than right out of our bay. Now, many of you may not like oysters. I happen to really love oysters. I like them fixed in all variety of ways. But you might think, well, I don't really care about oysters, so why should I care? Well, oysters are one of those very, very important species that we have in Galveston Bay. You have a small little uh, three to five inch oyster, and those oysters, the way they feed themselves is they pump water over their gills and they filter out food. And one little oyster can um, filter about 50 gallons of water in one day. So they're like little wastewater treatment plants for us, and they keep uh, they are performing an important ecological uh, service for us by keeping our waters clean by removing um, pollutants that we that we might have to pay for having removed if we didn't have all those great oysters. Now you might wonder what you were thinking. I don't want to eat polluted oysters, Julie. Well, I don't either. But our oysters that are harvested come from clean waters that are um, monitored by our uh, state agencies. So um, the oysters that we eat out of Galveston Bay are terrific. And those oysters that are provi providing ecological services, we don't eat those so much. So anyway, I'm going to continue on. Our fishing values, we have a third of the Texas commercial fishing income which is about $358 million a year, and over half of our Texas recreational fishing revenues, which is $2.8 billion per year. So, I mean, envi environmentally, Galveston Bay is important, but also economically, $2.8 billion per year. So when we have events on the bay that may impact our waters, they keep people from coming in uh, recreating on our bay, it really has a financial impact on our area and on our state. We have challenges in the Galveston Bay area. Our watershed goes all the way up to the past the Dallas-Fort Worth area. We have 7 million people living in the five counties around the Galveston Bay, and we're one of the fastest growing populations in the nation. So there, and each of us may do things every day that add to the challenges of Galveston Bay. We've lost a lot of wetlands in Galveston Bay, about 20% of our wetlands, and a lot of this is due to subsidence and dredge and fill activity. We used to take water from underground to use uh, in uh, industry, but also uh, for our uh, watering our yards and um, drinking and all kinds of things. And um, we have clay soils down here. So when you remove water, the land collapses or sinks. It's kind of like there's a balloon underneath with the water, and as you take the water out of that balloon, the land above it collapses. Well, we've stopped a lot of the use of, uh, of water, and so we've stopped uh, underground, so we've stopped a lot of the subsidence, and now we're restoring those marshes that are so important to us. But you can see the acreage losses that even continued uh, um, into the uh, early 2000s and are still continuing, but the losses are a lot less now. We have a lot of other challenges. We have water pollution, which impacts much of our bays, creeks, and portions of Galveston Bay, making uh, places unsuitable for fishing or swimming. So we do have issues that uh, are problems for Galveston Bay. Some of our water quality issues are low dissolved oxygen, which may not be a problem for us, but if you're a fish, crab, or shrimp, and you're swimming in the water, you need uh, to have a certain level of dissolved oxygen in the water in order to, um, to do well. And sometimes we have low dissolved oxygen, which causes uh, can cause fish kills in our area. We have seafood advisories on Galveston Bay. I said Galveston Bay is great for seafood eating, but there are some problems too. Um, and there are consumption advisories for all of Galveston Bay for catfish. So, um, and this is from the um, Texas Department of Health Seafood Safety. They are the ones who monitor and set the advisories. So this is the advisory for catfish. And the problem with catfish is the dioxins and PCBs 
that uh, that can bioaccumulate in the flesh of catfish. Uh, so if you're a woman of childbearing age or a child under the age of 12, you should not consume catfish. Uh, and if you're not in that category, then uh, you, you, the recommended amount to eat is one meal per month, which is about eight ounces or about um, the size of uh, a, a piece of meat or fish fillet that would fit in the palm of your hand. So not very much. The problem with for the, uh, this advisory is many of our um, fishermen who are subsistent fishermen go after catfish and uh, that can be a real problem because all of a sudden their families may be eating more um, catfish and bioaccumulating these, pro these uh, dioxins and PCBs. So we keep advisories out and there are uh, mar signs marking uh, places that uh, are problems for um, catfish and consumption in Galveston Bay. Other advisories are in the Upper Houston Ship Channel. And these are for um, this advisory in the, uh, high, uh, the, the most upper part of the ship channel is for all species of fish and crab. And that's also do not eat if you're a woman of childbearing age or a child under the age of 12. And the problem there are dioxins, organochlorine, pesticides, and PCBs. Um, if you're not in that category, then you can do the um, about five to eight ounces per month or the size of what would fit in the palm of your hand. Um, and in this area, this is for this advisory is for um, all species of catfish, spotted sea trout and blue crab. Uh, and this is also a problem because of dioxins and PCBs. So we do have issues uh, in our area. And I will tell you, you know, that our um, State Department of Health um, and the Seafood Safety Division, they monitor this and these advisories are updated. So they're constantly seeing, are things changing? So follow these advisories if you're uh, interested in going fishing and know what, what species you can catch and keep and feel good about taking home and enjoying with your family. So because Galveston Bay is so important to us nationally and in the state of Texas, Congress recognized Galveston Bay as an estuary of national significance. And this happened in the early 90s. And it's a non-regulatory program that was is, uh, uh, managed by the Texas Commission on Environmental Quality and funding comes from EPA in addition uh, to, to state funding. And um, so it's an amazing program that happened. Uh, when Congress designated as an estuary of national significance, it began a process of a five-year process to study what is going on in Galveston Bay. What are the issues? What do we need to do to take care of this important estuary? And so um, you had you had um, scientists sitting across the table from environmentalists. You had the chemical industries there. You had um, you had the environmentalists sitting there. You had uh, uh, state and federal and uh, uh, agencies. You had recreational fishermen and commercial fishermen all sitting around the table trying to figure out what the problems were for Galveston Bay. So they studied the bay for five years, and then they developed the Galveston Bay plan. And that plan is a living document and is still used to, man to monitor and to manage what we should be doing to take better care of Galveston Bay. And um, the document was just uh, updated in 2018. So it is a very much, uh, like I said, a living document. And those uh, and that changes as our situation changes in Galveston Bay. Uh, you can check backthebay.org, which is uh, the um, uh, uh, public education part of the Galveston Bay um, estuary program and, and the plan. And it, this is uh, just a, a, a picture from their website, but it has a lot of information that I've given you today. So um, backthebay.org, check it out. So the estuary program, when they were studying uh, what was going on in Galveston Bay, they found that non-point source pollution as the number one pollutant source for Galveston Bay. And that is not that is the pollution that runs off our yards and streets. It is not what comes out of a pipe. That can be fairly easily regulated. It, what runs off our yards and streets is not so easy to regulate. So, um, you know, I used to, we used to think we could point our fingers at the chemical industries, but actually 
It's when I look in the mirror at myself in the morning, or you might look in the mirror too, and you can say, I am a big contributor to non-point source pollution in Galveston Bay. Now you gotta remember, our watershed goes all the way up past the Dallas-Fort Worth area. And we have, half, uh, I think it's half the population of the state of Texas, almost half of it lives in our watershed. So we have a lot of potential impacts and that's um, how they uh, part of, we're a part of this issue. So we used to think it was big issues like this when we have a spill on Galveston Bay. And uh, this is where a barge was hit by a tanker. We used to think these were the big issues, but it's more actions like this, our individual actions. Each year, more than 130,000 barrels of oil reach Galveston Bay from stormwater runoff. So our actions really are a big part of the solution to how well, how well Galveston Bay is going to do. So what goes down that storm drain? Most people believe that what goes down that storm drain goes to a wastewater treatment plant and is taken care of uh, and treated and passed back into the, uh, into the bay or creeks or the bayous. Well, but actually what goes down a storm drain goes directly to your creeks, bayous, and bay. It is not treated. So when we have, uh, whether it be uh, oil or grass clippings or whatever goes down, all of that goes directly to the bay. Now, this is actually um, um, molasses. And so as far as we know, molasses isn't a problem for Galveston Bay. Yay. <laughs> In many neighborhoods, you may see uh, signs like this, dump no waste drains to bay, or they may be stickers or kind of slick looking. Um, so this is a reminder to communities that what goes down that drain goes directly to Galveston Bay. But you can see in this neighborhood, it wasn't really doing much good because you can see the grass clippings here. Well, you might think, well, Julie, why are grass clippings a big deal? Well, grass clippings add nitrogen to water as they decay and stuff. And so nitrogen in water acts just like it does on our turf grass in our yard. It causes uh, algae to grow in the water. So you have algae blooms happen. You have fish moving in to feed on the algae. All of a sudden you have the fish eating, they're pooping, using a lot of oxygen, and all of a sudden they use up all the oxygen in an area and you have a fish kill. So even simple little things like this contribute to Galveston Bay's water quality issues. <clears throat> My colleague and I uh, were interested in this issue. So we decided to find out what was going on in our area. And we created this program called Galveston Yards and Neighbors. This program is no longer, it's been morphed into Water Smart now, but uh, the program uh, is to see what people were doing in the yards and how it might impact Galveston Bay. So we distributed 3000 questionnaires and we got about a 30% return. There were some uh, perks uh, associated with returning your questionnaire. And this is what we found from the questionnaires, what people told us that they were doing. We found that people love to fertilize. Fertilizing is a big um, pastime in our area. 24% of the people told us they fertilize four to six times a year. 3% told us they fertilize 12 times a year. So how many times should you really fertilize your lawn annually? Now, if y'all wanna type in the chat, um, then uh, you can kind of let me know what, uh, I don't think I can see the chat, but if y'all, um, maybe Chloe can let me know if y'all are, um, how, so how many times did you fertilize your yard annually? Anybody got an answer in there, Chloe? Nothing in the Q&A box so far, but the chat has a lot of answers. Okay. What's the chat? I can't read the chat. Uh, we have a couple zeros, um, one to two times, once, once, um, once, once, zero. Oh, y'all are great. Y'all have got the info. Okay. So what you can do is you can have a soil test done. And uh, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension will do a soil test. You send your uh, sample into them, and they will let you know exactly what you need to add to your turf grass in order to have it look the way you want it to look um, and what it might need. And so you're not over fertilizing. The test costs about 12 bucks and it takes about um, 
uh, about seven days to get the results back. And you can go to their website, soiltesting.tamu.edu to uh, get the information. Or you can come visit me at the uh, county extension office or at your local county extension office, and we can help you out. But having your soil tested will let you know what you really need, what your, what your yard needs. And you can also do this for your, uh, um, if you have flower beds and garden, uh, uh, vegetable gardens too. 50% told us, 50, uh, um, 50 told us they dispose of household hazardous waste in the trash. So what are some examples of household hazardous waste? Can y'all put it in the chat and then Chloe, you let me know what, what's in there? Oh, maybe I can read it here. Maybe this is, nope, I can't read it. So far, I see batteries and yeah. more batteries. Cool, cool. Uh, light bulbs, that's cool. Paint. Yeah. Drugs. Paint. Yes. Paint. Drugs, that's a good one too. Yeah. Tires. Yeah. Chemicals like bleach. Yes. How are household cleaning chemicals? Very good. So, so one of the things when we started this program, the Yards and Neighbors program is, uh, I have to tell you, I am not a big housekeeper. My mom trained me very differently and I shed my, her good training as quickly as I could. I named the dust bunnies as they go across my, um, uh, my floor at the house. Um, so I, I didn't think that this was a big deal on alternative household cleaning products. And one of my colleagues said, because that is a bunch of what household has in waste. It's what we have under our sinks that we use in our homes to clean. And one of my colleagues said, oh, Julie, I think this is an issue. And she had two and a half bathrooms. And she's, I was like, oh, are you sure it's an issue? And she said, yeah, I have two and a half bathrooms and I have 57 cleaning products in my house. And I was like, oh, that's an issue. Now you gotta remember, you know, a lot of this is gonna end up in the bay. So she put together a program called Mix It Yourself and it is alternative household cleaning products that you can use that are safer for the environment and maybe safer for you too. So here's just a, a little brochure that we have. If you're interested, you can email. I'll have my email at the end and uh, we'll send you this. But a lot of it is using like um, those old cleaners, um, ba baking soda, vinegar, um, vegetable or uh, mineral oil, those kind of things to uh, clean instead of some of the things that we um, might buy. Uh, and a lot of people choose these other alternative products because they are, they may be healthier for you. You may have an allergic reaction to some of your favorite cleaning products. So, so anyway, just a simple, simple things we can do around the house that can make a big impact on Galveston Bay. 52% told us they bag and discard their lawn clippings in the trash. So what are other uses for lawn clippings? Y'all can type it in the chat. I'm seeing compost. Composting, mulching. great. And mulching, that's a good one. Mulching. A lot of compost. Great. And then compost tea, which I don't know what that is, but that sounds oh. cool. Yeah, compost tea is really, really valuable. Yes, yes. So y'all are right on track, composting, uh, is a great uh, option for uh, our um, leave our, our uh, grass clippings. You can also leave it on a lawn. Uh, 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 so, and what what that means if you use a ugh, I'm sorry, use a mulching lawn mower, the grass clippings will be small enough that they will decay fairly quickly. And those uh, grass clippings over a year's time will add enough nitrogen for one fertilizer application. So composting or leave it on the lawn, uh, those are ways for you to reduce um, uh, putting or taking uh, grass clippings to the um, landfills. Um, I, I, did, I forgot to tell you that one of the things that's very interesting about um, our impact on um, the waters is and the use of fertilizers is we tend to over fertilize our little uh, turf areas up to 20 times more than a farmer would apply on that same 
turf area. So, or that same that same plot of land. So we, our goal oftentimes is green grass. Now, and a farmer's goal is green money. So he's not going to, or she is not going to spend more um, on fertilizer than is necessary to get the growth that they need. But we tend to do that. So, you know, we need to really be aware of what we're applying. So, you know, having your soil test, composting, leaving the uh, grass clippings on the lawn, those are all ways to reduce our impact. So a bay-friendly landscape, which is what we're all after, will help you conserve water, it creates habitat, it'll save money, and it reduces runoff or storm uh, water pollution. And a bay-friendly landscape, to get that, you put the right plant in the right place with the right care. So what that means is if you have water loving plants, you plant those all together. And, and, and you know, you plant the plants that will do well here. After our freeze, many of us are realizing that, gee, our, you know, those um, plants that are not native to our area, are they didn't make it. And a lot of the natives did. So, you know, using the right plant in the right place with the right care. Though a Houston Chronicle, one of my colleagues had an article this weekend and uh, that is exactly what she was talking about, um, is for us to be successful in our yards and also for us to reduce our impact on the waters that reach Galveston Bay and the bays and creeks and bayous that flow into the Galveston Bay. So let your actions be bay friendly. And remember, the runoff from your house can end up in Galveston Bay if you live in our area. Now, I'm just going to take a few more minutes because I mentioned the Texas Master Naturals when I started. These are volunteers who are trained in natural resource um, issues, and they get out there and they do restoration and education to uh, all audiences on these uh, resources. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about one of the projects that they got involved in and um, tell you a little bit about how they made it a big impact. And this is the kind of impact that each of us can make uh, when we're uh, working towards solutions. And um, so this is a tale of Fred Ethel and the amazing Texas Master Naturalists. Now, I hope some of you are, uh, are, I know who uh, Fred and Ethel are from the I Love Lucy series. I was a kid. I loved Lucy. I still enjoy watching I Love Lucy. But Fred and Ethel, in this case, were American oyster catchers. And Texas Master Naturals in the Galveston Bay area were monitoring American oyster catchers on small islands in the bay system. They were monitoring uh, how the nests were doing, you know, if there were any fledglings, uh, and they were uh, also um, oftentimes uh, uh, bird uh, banding the birds and stuff. And what was happening is the, the master naturals in, in their um, observations, they noticed that uh, many of the nests were failing because they're on these very, very low shell islands that were overrun with our storms that, that happen frequently and are happening more and more frequently as our climate is changing. And so the master naturalists were wanting to come up with solutions to how to protect these birds. And they named the two birds on the islands that they were, or two of the birds on the islands that they were monitoring, Fred and Ethel, in honor of um, Lucy and uh, her husband Desi's best friend, Fred and Ethel Mertz. So this is one of the master naturals, and this is one of the ideas that they had. They looked at uh, rock groins and jetties, and they thought, well, we'll put in small shell, crushed uh, oyster shell, which is what most of them are nesting on, in, on these uh, higher surfaces and see if the birds will nest. Well, the birds nested, and they did really well, except the little fledglings, when they tried to get out of the nest, they would fall in the rocks, and it wasn't great for them. So they looked at other solutions. So this is, uh, uh, they built condos on the islands and they put these, they're, they're like uh, wooden structures and they covered them with um, oyster shell. And they built seven of these on the island of Mertzville because that's where um, it's Fred and Ethel Mertz and they live on Mertzville. And uh, they put them in and a week later, we had a major storm that wiped out six of the uh, condos. One was left and that condo was used by um, Fred and Ethel to um, build a nest and to, to, uh, to, for fledglings to, to, um, um, to leave the nest. Um, 
I'm, I'm a fish person, not a bird person, y'all. Um, so the master naturalists were frustrated, though, and they wanted this to have a bigger impact. They wanted more birds to have successful nest. So they went to agencies and different agencies who are involved in net, uh, bird, bird population monitoring. And they, they got those agency reps out. They put them on their boats and they took them out to these islands and said, these are, this is what's happening. We've been watching it. We're monitoring. We think that there are uh, solutions. And, you know, they kept doing that, talking to the agencies and getting the agencies to understand the dedication that these volunteers had and the compassion they had for making a difference in this uh, survival of these uh, American oyster catchers. And over, and so they did this for a, uh, about a year and they were pretty you know, frustrated because they wanted change to happen. These are people who make change happen. And um, all of a sudden at one of the meetings, the uh, agencies came together and they said, we have some solutions. And before you knew it, there was money on the table to make the solutions. And one of the things that happened in this whole process is, is that the, the volunteers kept calling this one island with Fred and Ethel Mertzville. They named the place. When you name a place, it becomes important to people. And all of a sudden, people start paying attention because it has a name. So naming um, natural resource areas uh, is an important factor in us uh, making change happen for those areas. It becomes very uh, much more real and tangible if it has a name. So just an FYI on that. So anyway, the agencies got together. There's money on the table now to do this restoration. It was postponed because of COVID, but now the restoration will be starting in uh, this year. And so these volunteers were able to change agencies' mind and perceptions of what was going on in the Bay system to make change happen. And so now they're working on those islands to change the elevation so that oyster catchers will be more successful. And here, this is so this is happy beginnings. This is one of our volunteers with an American oyster catcher. They are a species that is of concern. And uh, you can see the little band on the leg. Um, so this is how people, individuals, each of us can make a change in what's going on in Galveston Bay, whether it be the things that we do in our yard and in our home or the work that we do uh, out in the field as a Texas master naturalist. Um, I hope that uh, I get to see you on Galveston Bay at some point. Uh, if you'd like to contact me about um, anything we talked about today, more information on the Mix It Yourself or Soil Test or the Master Naturalist Program, or if you just want to see what all is going on with Texas Sea Grant. Um, my um, email is here, julie.massey at ag.tamu. Edu, and I've really enjoyed being with y'all today. If y'all have any questions, I'm happy to stick around to try to answer those. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julie. That was great. Um, before you guys leave, we do have another set of polls. So that would be great if y'all could fill those out for us. Let's see. Please do. Please do. Thank y'all for coming today. It was really nice to have you with us. All right. Thank you guys so much for filling out our polls. Um, does anyone have any questions? I see someone raise their hand so if they could type it out into the chat box. That would be great.
Well, if nobody has any questions, um, I can, I guess this concludes this week's Seaside Chat. Thank you so much, Julie. I loved it. I feel like I learned a lot about the Bay and all the cool stuff you Texas Master Naturalists are doing. Um, oh, someone did ask something really quick. Could you put up the um, household components again, Julie? Sure, sure. I'll go back to that. And I can send you a, if you um, uh, drop me a note, I can send you a, um, copy of it. I think I can go back. Let's see if I can go and back. And this will, this is recorded, so we will put this up on our YouTube channel, so you guys are more than welcome okay. to go back and watch it. Um, and we have a comment here. Um, Julie, such a nice refresher. I heard echoes of the Galveston Bay Ambassador Program. Glad you have Warriors Now, smiley face. Thank you. That's great. Yes, yes. Uh, the, we are, we're all in this together, so the more we can share information and make change happen, the better off all of us will be and our bay will be so much better so and it's so nice to understand i think how connected we are to the bay so that was so cool thank you yeah thank you here's the picture yourself uh, and i could say if you drop me a note i'll be happy to send you the uh, publication awesome well thank you thank you to everyone who came to our seaside chat and um stay tuned to our social medias where we will post information about our next chat Thank you guys so much. And thanks, Julie. Have an amazing week. Bye. Thank you. Bye.